So I thought that I would ask David one or two questions, but then jump relatively quickly to questions that may come from the audience. And so we'll, we'll do our little talk show moment here. Um, so some, something that really struck me about your excellent presentation was this idea about I mean, talking to the artists in the Kusama Chamberlain discussion about having their work show up in you know a porn magazine or intersecting with the fashion community, film community, and and the quote that you said was that the artists were saying, well, you know, in a sense, we're just working with the working in doing things that are part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of either bookmaking or ephemera or production of things that fall into the categories that you've discussed, what do you, what's your sense of artists participating in that culture now? How do artists participate right. in that definition of sure. playing in the arena sure. of culture? <clears throat> well, first, I think the notion of what an artist is has changed so radically from the 1960s. And you have people like, I was thinking about this this morning, James Franco, who is a performer, an actor, an artist. And perhaps he does some of those things well, and perhaps he does none of those things well. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a lecture by uh, a guy named Seth Sigalov at the Museum of Modern Art. And for you, if you don't know, Seth Siglov was the first dealer, first person who was a promoter of, of conceptual art. Uh, we hold him quite dear because he was the guy who found a way of marketing this material. And the idea of marketing an idea, uh, while it's something that's part of the art world today, is not something that was part of the art world in the 1960s. I was wondering if you were going to mention him because people like Douglas Eubler and artists that were sharing were doing yeah. ads in magazines as exhibitions. Right. right. Oh, even well, <clears throat> what 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 Siegelob's invention was was that he was a guy who hated sitting still, and while he had a physical gallery space for a period of time, he was unhappy being locked into having to sit behind a desk, and so much in the same way that. Dan Graham hated the idea that if the work wasn't published, it shouldn't exist. Siegelob thought, well, why does the gallery need to exist if the artist's an idea? So he started doing exhibitions that were catalogs. The catalog was the exhibition. Uh, January, March, June, July, August, for example, are all titles of catalogs that are the exhibition. There's no physical manifestation, it is the catalog. And he was doing these things as a means of disseminability. Placing ads was another way of extending it out. I think you know one of the primary differences between our world today and the world of the 1960s and 70s is that Siglov described that period of time as being a much smaller world. That their communication was mostly on paper. That making a long distance telephone call was an ordeal and an expense and not particularly good as you heard the LeWitt photo telephone call. Um, so conversation was a key mode of address as well and that hanging out in bars was a big part of their environment. When you read letters, often you would recognize that these things were well considered, that people would make drafts of them. I know this from looking at Jean Noel's archives that there are drafts of letters People don't draft letters anymore. People tweet um, with a way that you instantly correct your letter before you send it. There's no couple copies. Exactly. So it's a, we, we live in a radically different environment. So something you mentioned last night, which I think would be worth re-engaging an extension of what we were just talking about, uh, if we understand that maybe what many of these artists understood, certainly the ones you're speaking about who are New York based, was that they were in a community, in a neighborhood, seeing each other often, could respond to each other, and could be in a place where different genres of production would intersect. Certainly now we're in a, an, if it was then a community of artists, we're now in an industry, a global industry. Mm -hmm. And we were talking last night about uh, on-demand printing. Now something we take for granted that one can actually make a book, design it yourself, and have it 
created relatively quickly and relatively cheaply, and that the whole infrastructure of interaction with others, mm -hmm. as well as the attempt to distribute and where you're going to put it, could you talk a little bit about how all of the history you spoke about sure. enters now into a very different kind of production? Sure. So I didn't, I didn't talk much about uh, my decision to leave printed matter at all. And the reason I left was that servicing 7,500 hours a year was a total pain in the ass. And what I meant by that is that um, in the 1960s and 70s and into the 90s, making a book was a considered practice. That is to say, when you decide to make a project, um, it was first an expense. There was a certain amount of upfront cost to making a book. Um, so it was a collaborative effort. More often than not, artists weren't doing artist publications by themselves. They were doing collaborations with places like Nexus um, and other pub small publishers, or gallerists, perhaps an institution. There were no real publishers to speak of that were publishing these styles of books. Um, so that delayed the possibility of making a book, that you had an idea as an artist, you would seek out someone to publish it, you would raise the capital to be able to do it, and then there was the factor that things were being done physically. So if you're making a book, you were more often than not working with a graphic designer who was helping you do the page layouts. Uh, typesetting was done photomechanically, so you had to find a photomechanical typeset house to help you with that. Um, if you're using photographs, the photographs would have to be translated into what were called veloxes and halftones. Um, and at every step along this process, before you even got to a press and did your blue lines, your intermediate testing, um, you had not only a long span of time from inception to process, you had a lot of interaction with people. Nothing happened overnight. Um, and this interaction was a cause for editing. It was a real consideration about what to leave in and what to take out. Uh, and at some point in time, artists often decided that the project was worth pursuing and they would drop it or they would make substantial renovations to their conception. And as I, I, I said last night, I think that this led to a, a generation of people who made really smart books that um, they were considered. They were a labor of both desire uh, and a means for extension of their craft, their, their, their practice, if you want to call it that, um, and a means for extending themselves. And in the case of Ruscha, I was pointing out that he was using these as calling cards, as mnemonic devices so that people would remember who he was. Today, when you make a book, you don't have to print a thousand copies. In the olden days, your, your cost was your upfront mechanical and production costs, not the actual running of the press line, which was sort of a nominal cost. Um, today, when you make a book, you can lay it out on your desktop computer, you can send it off to a, a print on demand as a PDF, and in 24 hours or less, you can have a book done. And the compression of conception to realization, I think, has led to a lot of horrible books um, that people don't have the same consideration, restraints that they used to have. You can certainly make the argument that makes for a better environment by and large. That is to say that the capacity to make a book now is no longer constrained by financial considerations. But at the same time, I'm going to make the argument that it also leads to a lot of things that probably should have never seen the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> One question maybe before turning it over to the audience is, is there a book or a piece of ephemera, artist ephemera, that has so far eluded you, either in your own collection or MoMA's collection? Some holy grail out there that you just haven't gotten your hands oh, on? there's yet? lots of them. <laughs> what, would, what, would, what, would, what would some of those be? So one of my closest friends was a guy named Stephen Lieber. Stephen Lieber was a collector and dealer based in San Francisco who passed away uh, about three years ago now. And in 2001, Stephen put together a book called Extra Art. Extra Art was an enormous compendium of ephemeral material by artists. 
and in it documents over a thousand pieces of ephemera with information about who published it, who the artists were, when it was made. And I've been systematically going through that book and clicking things off. Do I have this? Do I want this? And by and large, I've been very successful in finding everything. And the museum actually bought Stephen's extra art collection. Oh, beautiful. So uh, we now have that I'm trying to for remember, six it, months. It, was it at NYU? It was somewhere as a show. I can't remember. It, it's, it was CCA in San Francisco, right, so and it, it traveled internationally. Um, the problem was before I, well before I got to MoMA, we, I helped him pitch it to MoMA as an exhibition. And because Stephen was a dealer, and the material was largely owned by him, the museum rejected the In my office is a piece um, from my own collection, uh, which is uh, Bastian Otter's Search of Miraculous. And for, if you're not familiar with Bastian Otter, he was a, a Dutch artist who was living in Southern California, whose final work was um, a piece in which he uh, planned to sail from Massachusetts to Amsterdam for the opening of his exhibition, but was lost at sea. So his final artwork is the announcement for this piece, and it's a photograph of him in a very small sailboat in Southern California um, as he's launching out on a test drive, so to speak. And in script at the bottom, it says, in the search of miraculous. And that's sort of what gets you out of bed every day, is that literally the search for the miraculous. You want to find something that you've never seen before and to think about it in ways that you've never seen possible to think about. That, that phrase sort of covers everybody in the system, yeah. artists, dealers, curators. Exactly. Um, so I think it would be a good time. We have uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to maybe open up to questions from the audience. Hang on one second, because we're getting a microphone. Um, Hi. Um, the search for the miraculous, and what was it you said? Uh, Calligraphy of Detris. I might steal that. I love that. Um, I'm curious to know how you feel about, uh, let's see, you said you're a self-proclaimed hoarder, but you're talking a lot about conceptual pieces, the physicality of something, as opposed to something that has no presence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious to know how you feel about that personally as a curator. Um, and I'm also, and I, this broader discussion, and you've touched on it, and maybe it's more obvious, but um, how you feel about the way changes in media um, and also um, war would drive artists <laughs> to try to do things that were more ephemeral or faster mm -hmm. and the you know, negativity of that? Um, I think it comes as no surprise that everything could be commoditized, that in the 1960s, and so the Lucy the Pard frames out this notion of dematerialization through a book she calls um, Six Years, documents the period 1966 to 1972, in which artists were making this material that they thought couldn't be collected. And if anything, we've learned that everything can be collected. And one of the beauties of eBay, for example, is that everyone wants something. And there's always a home for just about anything. Uh, we haven't found a way of not commoditizing things. And that works both to the advantage of an institution and to the detriment of it. Uh, about three years ago, we bought uh, a Tino Segal piece titled The Kiss. And it, it literally is that you hire two actors to, to kiss, right? Um, and it seems like such a simple thing. But in the artist's mind, uh, it's a sculpture, and that one must treat it the same way that you treat a Richard Serra, which is to say that I wanted to put it in my cage show. I thought it would have been a perfect conclusion to the exhibition. And then you start reading the artist's contract, and the artist's contract stipulates that you can't do it in an exhibition for a limited period of time. It has to be through the entire exhibition. That is, if you were to install Richard Serra, you're going to pay for the expense of installation, and it's going to be there for the entire run of the exhibition, not for a weekend. And so consequently, the expense of doing this piece would have been far too great to actually have up for eight months. So there's the pluses and the minuses of dematerialization. 
And a lot of it has to do with the framing of how artists want to see it themselves. Maybe it's, um, both, both things are kind of a lot of mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's one of the beauties of mining archives is that you come across unbelievable things. And in my mind, I want to frame so much of it as a reform dealer and reform collector as this detritus is being art. And yet, so many of the times you look at it critically now as a curator, you go, well, it's really a beautiful object, but it's archive material, which is to say it itself is not art because the artist himself or herself didn't claim it to be art. They claim it to be process material. And so there's a disconnect between what we want to do intellectually with it versus what we think about it in terms of its physicality. Don't make me call people. <laughs> we need a party starter. Or we will do the Iggy Pop thing. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> um, Trevor or Andy, actually. Andy, as a, as a person deeply invested in archive practices, maybe you have a question? I just want wonder if you could just talk a little more, more about the final thing you said, which is about how things get contextualized and recontextualized, but at the same time remain mm -hmm. static. If you have anything to add to that. So one of the things I've always been fascinated with is trying to get back to the originality of so I showed an image of Linda Bangless's art format from 1974. And the genesis of that ad I thought was really interesting. Uh, and there's been so many layers of history, so many layers of critique that have been added to it. And I think there was, I know there's been a misinterpretation of what that piece was all about. Um, and so I, wanted, I did a show also for Susan's gallery, where I wanted to get back to the originality of it, to strip away the varnish and the baloney that had been heaped upon it. Yeah. And to do that, you had to tell a much broader narrative. And so you had to talk about how Linda Bangless and Robert Morris had a relationship going back to 1972. And how Linda saw herself um, in some sort of competition uh, with Robert Morris as a sculptor, as an artist, and how she started essentially sticking her finger at him a little bit, poking at him a little bit. Um, and it took the guise of other ads that she placed that play against Robert Morris. Uh, Robert Morris and James Dean were born on the same day. They were the same age. Morris was obsessed by James Dean. They owned the same Porsche Spider, the Porsche Spider that so Linda takes an ad out of an art form in which she has slicked her hair back sort of like a Chicana. And she's leaning against a Porsche, a Porsche Spider. And she places that ad in art form um, the same month that Robert Morris has a cover story in the issue about him. And it's really her saying, hey, you know, I can be a guy too. I, I have balls. And then she does a piece where she has herself photographed by the photographer Annie Leibowitz in sort of a three-quarter profile from behind with her pants down by her ankles. And again, she's poking at Robert Morris, who's been infamous throughout the 1960s for doing performative acts naked. And Morris responds by poking back at Linda somewhat playfully, perhaps, perhaps not. Um, in which he has his then girlfriend, Rosalind Krauss, take a photograph of him. And that's the photograph that you probably are familiar with, Robert Morris wearing a Nazi helmet with wrist restraints and, and chains, uh, which is an advertisement for a poster done in conjunction with a show that Morris is doing in the summer of 74, spring of 74, in, at both the Sana Bend and Castelli galleries. And so that's, that's a direct poke back at Linda. 
And that poster itself has become this, now 50 years, 40 years later, has become, somehow become invested with gay identity, which is certainly not what Morris was interested in. Morris was interested in the ladies, in particular Rosalind Krauss, and Rosalind Krauss was not particularly interested in Linda Bangless. And so you can see there's a poke going back. So Linda responds to Up the Ante with her November 1974 ad of herself naked with a giant dildo and places that ad in Art Form magazine. And it's not an ad for an exhibition. It's not tied to a program or a project or a show. It itself is the art object. It's an artist, publicate, artist project within a uh, periodical. It's the fourth and fifth page within the November issue, so it's very hard to miss. It's the first thing you see. Um, and you have to understand that Linda was also making a direct poke not only back at Robert Morris, but at Rosalind Krauss. Rosalind Krauss was then the associate editor of Art Form, and you can understand how Rosalind Krauss would take this as an affront to her. That she, uh, she sees Linda as someone who's invading her territory. Um, and she and a number of other editors resign in protest that uh, they feel impinged upon that an artist has the temerity to insert themselves into what they see as their editorial venue, art form. And that's sort of odd because Linda's not the first person to have done this. Uh, Ed Roche, in the early 1960s, uh, under the student of Eddie Russia, is the graphic designer for Art Form when it was based originally in, uh, in Los Angeles before it moves to New York. And in lieu of payment, he occasionally has ads in the periodical. There's a really great one that says, uh, Ed Roche says goodbye to college joys, and it's a photograph of Ed in bed with two women. Uh, Stephen Kaltenbach, for a whole year, places a panel ad in art form. Many artists engaged in, in it by inserting themselves. <coughs> Linda has the balls to do it in the front of the periodical uh, in color. And so oh, you can understand the controversy. And also, obviously, the controversy about a naked lady with a giant dildo. Doesn't remind, I, I think I'm right in this. Doesn't the text on the black panel also say that she's represented by Paula, Paula Cooper? Cooper? So that was a conceit that she had to make because Paula had to become somehow engaged, but it had no relationship. Paula just was the, uh, the siphon for the money, but Linda paid for the ad by the T-shirts that I put. Right, but you also then have this interesting scenario where that text and that image turns Paula into a pimp on some level or another, or the gallop into the procurer yeah. of like, we represent this artist, this artist is now right. doing these, this image, right? Yeah. I mean, it's both, kind of funny. Both, both Linda and Paula discounted that. And okay. that their, the magazine forced them to having to put that text there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as the conceit for allowing the ad to run. So in addition to the whole Rosalind story, you can understand that these periodicals are sent out to the subscriber base, and the subscriber base goes all up in arms, a portion of it about this ad, and starts writing letters back to the, the editor, canceling their subscription, demanding to know if uh, they should expect other pornographic images to appear in the periodical. Um, and at the same time, they start getting letters from people saying how amazing they think this thing is, how empowering this image is. An unknown woman painter writes this beautiful handwritten note saying how she sees it as um, this seminal iconographical image that gives her power. This is Elizabeth Murray. Um, and what was so great about the show was that Linda gave me access to her archives. And so the exhibition, as you can imagine what this will look like, starts with a video that Linda makes about Robert Morris. Robert Morris then turns the video into Morris about a video rather about Linda making a movie about himself. All the ads, the Morris poster, the Bankless ad, all the letters, and then two more years of spill out in which now that um, this image is in the world, 
and people have to react against it. So Ms. Magazine runs an ad about, uh, runs a story by Lucy the Park about female empowerment. Um, New York Magazine also does it as, a, as an article about women in the arts. And then the punchline of the story is that Rosalind Krauss, who's now out in the wilderness and has no place to publish, um, and her fellow co-publishers from the period from Art Forum have resigned, have no venue. And they found October Magazine. October Magazine starts in 1976. And in converse to Art Forum, which has a certain amount of levity and artist contributions and is, has color, October is humorless, no artist. Black and white. Black and white. And Full text. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the story. You know, so instead of all of this other stuff that has been heaped upon it, I'm much more interested in the originality. So context is really about going back to a moment when we think about how things were presented within their original context. Doesn't mean that we can't reframe it. Doesn't mean that we can't think about how the act from 1974 can't be seen alongside art from 2014. I'm just sort of interested in trying to remove all this varnish to get back to what the original surface looked like. Trevor, do you want to have the? Um, I was just going to say, um, I just finished building a large bookshelf that takes up a huge section of my wall and um, to store all our books. And I'm going to spend probably 10 times as much saving a little recovered hard drive. And um, not only will the next buyers of my house tear down this bookshelf probably, but I was wondering if you stay awake at night thinking about digital and uh, collecting maybe digital artist books. So my business, so after I left Print and Banner, I started this thing called Specific Object. Specific Object as opposed to Print and Banner, which was a nonprofit, was a for-profit business. And I saw it sort of as a four-ring circus. There was a physical gallery, which was for my entertainment and presenting things and if people liked what I did great, it wasn't how I was going to make a living. There was an inventory of books, which was how I was making a living. And people could come to me or buy them online. Um, I was doing appraisals. But what was most interesting to me was that I decided that I wanted to build a very large scale database. And so that anything that I touched that came through my inventory got scanned, got cross-referenced, as I mentioned with John Noel's project, how he cross-referenced everything by hand, I cross-referenced everything electronically. So the website still exists. You can't buy anything anymore because there's nothing left to sell, and I can't be involved in the world of Congress. But you can go on the site, and we indexed every issue of Art Forum. So if you're interested in Ed Roche and Art Forum, or Eddie Russia and Art Forum, you can hyperlink to see every issue of Art Forum that Ed Roche intersects with. And you can drill down through that and see this sort of amazing data compilation. I talked about uh, Stephen Lieber's book, Extra Art. We decompiled that book so that every object that Stephen referenced that was within specific objects inventory history could also see. So you see the page about the book Extra Art, and underneath it you saw the hot links to every piece of ephemera, and then you could go back and forth. And so I'm, I'm fa I was always fascinated by this. So that exists on a server in Delaware. There's a backup server in Hong Kong. It is on gold CD-ROMs that have been distributed here and there. That is important, super important. But I hate digital art. <coughs> If you pass that back, maybe one more. <coughs> Excuse me. I actually wanted to ask about specifically net art then. And so not just, you know, digi making digital the printed, but so when the Tumblr is essentially taking mm -hmm. over the artist book, you know, so you're saying that, how, yeah, how do you feel about that? I know it's kind of a tired question, but. I don't, I don't know. It, it hasn't been a resolved question. Right, that uh, technology 
as much as I love technology and I want to be the first person on the next whatever, um, it's incredibly problematic from a couple of standpoints. One, it's incredibly problematic from uh, a longevity standpoint. That when artists began to start publishing things on CD-ROMs, I, I, I was the first person out there maybe to start buying the stuff in volume. And a lot of that stuff was being made in a, a platform called Macromedia Director. And I don't think Macromedia no longer exists. It was bought by Adobe many years ago. They dropped the platform. And now, how do you read this stuff? So there's sort of this inherent problem of variable media, as that it's called. And how do you preserve it? Does it mean you have to go out and buy a dozen Macs from the 1990s or earlier to preserve it? Um, how do you carry it forward? Because the formatting for so much of that material is, is now lost. Um, institutionally, we can do this. But as, a, as an individual consumer of technology, it's really complicated. Um, the other issue for me is, in terms of books has always been that I love the physicality. Uh, I like the look, the look, the touch, the feel of something. And I think that hasn't been quite well resolved yet in a digital format, although there are certainly things that you see now that have multimedia capacity. Telling a narrative on, a, on an iPad is, is, in some ways, a lot better. And then I hate the idea of DMR, the whole notion of digital rights management, that precludes the capacity for you to, to move it onto another platform to share it with people. Um, I find that um, disappointing. I always hate to end on disappointing. <laughs> but I think that's probably where we should conclude our, our morning. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and certainly, Linda, a lovely round of applause for David. Thank you very much.